Welcome. In this video, we're going to be learning about epistasis. Now, before we talk about epistasis, let's have a quick reminder of what happens during a dihybrid cross. So in a dihybrid cross, we have two genes, gene A and gene B. And we can see that in both genes, each gene codes for a particular characteristic. For example, gene A codes for hair color, whereas gene B codes for hairstyle. So here, each gene codes for a characteristic. However, here we have gene A again and gene B. We can see that gene B still codes for a characteristic, hairstyle. However, we haven't been told what gene A codes for. So it doesn't code for a characteristic at all in this case. Gene A, in fact, controls the expression of gene B. This is an example of epistasis. So in epistasis, we have two genes which interact and one gene controls the expression of another gene. So the gene that's responsible for controlling the other gene is called the epistatic gene. And the gene that's being controlled is referred to as the hypostatic gene. Now, gene A has two versions, big A and small a. So in this example, we'll say the dominant version of gene A. So meaning you can have two big A's or a big A and small a, will say yes to the next gene. So it will promote the expression of the next gene. However, small a, in other words, having two small a's in the genotype, will prevent the expression of the next gene. So in this scenario, because the small version of gene A is preventing or covering or masking gene B, we say that this is recessive epistasis. So epistasis literally means to cover. So if the small version of the epistatic gene is covering or preventing the next gene, then we say it is recessive epistasis. So let's say we have this genotype. What phenotype will this person have? To find that out, we're going to first look at the epistatic gene. So in this case, we can see that overall, the epistatic gene is dominant. That means go ahead to the next gene and read it. The next gene has two big Bs, so dominant overall, and therefore this person will have straight hair. Let's do another example. So let's say you have two big A's, a big B, small b. Again, we start with the epistatic gene. Overall, this is dominant. That means go ahead to the next gene. Read the next gene, and that's also dominant overall, meaning, again, this person will have straight hair. What about in this scenario? Epistatic gene is overall dominant. We read the next gene, and that's overall recessive, so this person will have wavy hair. One final example. What about if someone had two small a's, a big b, small b? Again, reading the epistatic gene, we see that overall it is recessive, which means don't go to the next gene. The next gene will not be expressed. So it doesn't matter if it's dominant or recessive on the next gene, neither will be expressed. So the hair will neither be straight nor wavy. As for the phenotype for this individual, that will be specified in the question. So we'll do an example of this. Um, but just to quickly summarize, this this or this, which by the way, we can write as this in dash form because all three of them have two small a's and after that, it doesn't matter if it's a big b or small b. So in all three of these genotypes, the characteristic gene hairstyle will not be expressed. So again, all three of these will neither have straight nor wavy hair. Let's do an example and put this into practice. Okay, so here's an example. If you want, you can pause the video and read the question. Once you're ready, press play and we can go through it together. Okay, so in this question, we have two genes. The first gene is R, big R codes for red flowers, and small R codes for pink flowers. And at the same time, we have gene Q. Big Q allows the expression of gene R, and small Q inhibits the expression of gene R. So again, we can see that here we have an example of recessive epistasis. So we'll write gene Q and R like this. And the question is, what are the phenotypes of the roses? So bearing in mind that big R is red and small R is pink and big Q and small Q are simply go and no. So it's not a dihybrid cross. It's an example of epistasis. One gene is epistatic and the other gene is hypostatic. 
And again, we can see that in the epistatic gene, it's the recessive version that's saying no, that's preventing it. And therefore, it's recessive epistasis. Okay, first genotype. We're going to look at the epistatic gene first. Overall, that's dominant. That means go on to the next gene. Next gene is overall dominant, so red. Second example, again, starting with the epistatic gene, which is dominant overall. That means go to the next gene, and again, that's going to be red. Next one, epistatic is overall recessive. That means the next gene will not be expressed. So in this scenario, it comes out as white, as mentioned in the question. Roses with no pigment appear white. Okay, next gene. Again, overall recessive, so it doesn't matter what's next, and it's going to be white. And finally, overall dominant, so that means go to the next gene, and next gene is two small r's, so that's going to be pink. Okay, so to summarize this question, any genotype that falls under this general structure, meaning it has a big Q followed by either a big Q or a small Q, then a big R followed by either a big R or a small R, so any of these four, they will be red. Then any genotype that has this structure, big Q followed by big Q or small Q, and then two small R's, so either this or this, will be pink. And lastly, if you have two small Qs, it doesn't matter what the next two alleles are. So any of these will be white, will be neither red or pink. And as a result, they will be white. Now, the next important thing is ratios. So let's quickly remind ourselves of the dihybrid heterozygous cross. So we'll say we have two genes and each gene codes for a characteristic. Remember, this is not epistasis. This is a normal dihybrid cross. And if we bring back our two test subjects, Steve and Natasha, um, we can see that Steve would produce the following gametes, and so would Natasha. And if we were to cross them, we would get 16 genotypes for their offspring, and those 16 will be split as a ratio of 9, 3, 3, 1. This is a ratio that you have to remember whenever you have a dihybrid heterozygous. And we can also say that we know exactly what each of those numbers represent by remembering this. For example, nine individuals will have dominant on gene one, so overall A will be dominant, and dominant on gene two. Now also notice here that there are four possible characteristics. Brown and straight hair, brown and wavy hair, blonde and straight hair, and blonde and wavy hair. So there are four genotypes, hence there are four ratios. But what would happen to this ratio in epistasis? So if we go back to this example of the roses, we can see that there are only three genotypes. And this is something that is common in epistasis. You will always have three genotypes. So let's use this and make an epistasis table. Okay, let's see how these ratios would work for recessive epistasis. So we're going to bring back our two test subjects, and instead of saying that we have two genes which both code for a characteristic, we're going to say that the first gene doesn't code for a characteristic, and only the second gene codes for a characteristic. So in this case, we'll say that large A allows the expression of the second gene, and small A prevents the expression of the second gene. So that means gene A will be the epistatic gene, the controlling gene, and gene B will be hypostatic the one that is being controlled. Also, if there are two small a's, that means the individual will not have either straight hair nor wavy hair. So we'll say that they'll have no hair at all. Of course, this is just for the example. So if we cross both of these individuals in our Punnett square, just like before, we're going to get 16 offspring and they're going to have the following genotypes. As for their phenotypes, starting with the top left, we can see that this will be straight hair. Overall dominant on A, so that means go to the next gene. Next gene is overall dominant again, so straight hair. This one will also be straight hair. So will this one, and so will all of these. We can see that this genotype will have wavy hair. Overall dominant on A means you can go to the next gene, and this is overall recessive, so that will be wavy hair. And just like that, these two will also be wavy hair. Over here, however, 
we have overall recessive on gene A. That means you won't have either straight hair nor wavy hair. So we said that this individual will have no hair at all. Same with this one and same with these two. Okay, so we can see there are 16 genotypes, just like dihybrid cross. However, we also said that in recessive epistasis, we will only see three possible genotypes. And that's what we see here, straight, wavy, or no hair. The ratio for these genotypes can be expressed as nine, three to four. Nine individuals have dominant on the epistatic gene, so big A, big A, or big A, small a, and they also have dominant on the hypostatic gene, which means big B, big B, or big B, small b. And these nine individuals all have straight hair. Three individuals have dominant on the epistatic gene again, so big A, big A, or big A, small a, but they have recessive on the hypostatic gene, so two small b's. And these three have wavy hair. And finally, four individuals have recessive on the epistatic gene. Now, if the epistatic gene is recessive, then it doesn't matter what the hypostatic gene has because it's not going to be expressed anyway. And these four have no hair. So to finish off, we're going to compare dihybrid heterozygous versus recessive epistasis. In dihybrid heterozygous, we have two genes and both code for a characteristic. In recessive epistasis, we have two genes. One is a controlling gene and one is a characteristic gene. The controlling gene is also known as the epistatic gene and this controls the hypostatic gene. In both scenarios, if we were to cross two individuals which are both heterozygous, then we get the following ratios. Starting with dihybrid, we have 16 offspring, they will have a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio with the following combinations for the genotypes. And for recessive epistasis, again we will have 16 offspring, however there will only be 3 phenotypes which are split as a 9 to 3 to 4 ratio with the following combinations for the genotypes. Okay, so in this video, we had an introduction to recessive epistasis. In the next video, we're going to do some practice questions involving recessive epistasis. Hey guys, if that video helped you, support our channel by liking, subscribing, and sharing it with your friends. And more importantly, if you still have questions, drop a post on our forum at examqa.com where I will personally be there to help answer your questions. Mohammed signing out.